Hey, welcome to day 35 of 40 Days with Jesus. I'm Michael Hoff with Digital Theologian, and I'm glad that you're tuning in. Today, we're looking at Jesus before Pilate in John chapter 18. Where we left off yesterday, Jesus was before Pilate, and Peter had just denied him for the third time as the rooster crowed. And what had been going on was that Jesus was brought at night to be tried. The Sanhedrin had to be gathered, so this is taking a while. And over the course of the entire night, Jesus is being accused, he's being tried, right? There's a lot that's going on behind the scenes that's not fully discussed or really brought to the fore in the Gospel of John. We see that Jesus is before Caiaphas. We have Peter denying him. So Jesus is being faithful to testify to who he is while Peter is denying him. The Jewish leadership now wants to have Jesus tried before Pilate so that they can have the Romans kill him. And this is something that the Jews have tried to do multiple times throughout the Gospel of John. The Jewish leadership has recognized that Jesus is a threat because if the crowds believe in Jesus as the Messiah, there might be an uprising to overthrow the Romans. And that is something that those like the Sadducees and the Pharisees who have become deeply enmeshed in the inner workings of the Roman government, they don't want their lifestyle overturned. They don't want to see the Roman Empire overthrown in Judea. They have walked that path before. It hasn't been that long. They've seen Jewish kings crushed. And these people are people that are invested in the status quo. If the Romans can kill Jesus, then the Jewish leadership doesn't have to worry about the ramifications of all of these pilgrims who have seen Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead are, that are still in the city for Passover. They don't have to worry about any of these people who've been believing in Jesus. They, that whole problem gets eliminated when Jesus is killed by the Romans. And so they would then be able to take advantage of and control any kind of revolt that might happen. But we know ultimately that that is not what they want. They want the status quo to be maintained for the foreseeable future. And so they bring Jesus to Pilate in the morning. And we're told at this point that they don't want to enter the house of a Gentile because it will make them unclean. So they don't go into Pilate's dwelling because they don't want to be ceremonially unclean so that they can celebrate Passover. But this creates an interesting dynamic that where Jesus could have been engaged by Pilate publicly with these Jewish leaders. Now he's brought into Pilate's house and a lot of the interaction between Jesus and Pilate happens privately or at least separate from the Jewish leaders and their commentary on Jesus and his actions. So we have some interesting dynamics that are at play. Jesus is brought here to face the challenge of being king of the Jews. That is the concern that Pilate has because he's not worried about some internal squabble, any kind of theological concern that the Jews might have. Jesus's theological claims in relation to Judaism are irrelevant to Pilate. What Pilate cares about is whether or not Jesus is going to lead some sort of armed insurrection. If he does that, then Pilate has to crush him and he has to crush his movement and he needs to do it swiftly. Why? Well, you know, Pilate's an interesting guy. He was a relatively minor Roman noble who was given a governorship in Judea, really the backwater of the empire. And so here he is on the backside of the empire uh, trying to control Judea. And it's a people group that has constantly been in revolt. Jesus isn't the first leader to claim to be the Messiah. There have been some before, there will be others after. And Pilate has to respond to them viciously. So when faced with the possibility of losing power, influence, and wealth, Pilate chooses to crush violently those who rise up against him. Pilate's cruelty is well documented by Jewish writers of this time. He was cruel, he was harsh, he was vicious. So this interaction with Jesus is all the more interesting because of how he responds throughout. Jesus has just finished asking the Jewish leadership what crime are you trying me for? He wanted to know what case they had against him, which would have forced them to testify to his works and to his claims. And now as these leaders bring Jesus before Pilate, 
Pilate wants to know the same thing. What crime has this man done? What do you accuse him of? And it's very fascinating to me that the Jewish leadership doesn't respond with a definitive answer. They say, look, hey, hey, we wouldn't have brought him here. There's no reason for you to worry about it. Just forget about it. There's nothing to worry. We, if he weren't a crook, we wouldn't have brought him to you. Bad accents aside, there's something fishy going on here, right? They bring Jesus to Pilate so that he can kill him. And they don't even want to mention a crime. And so Pilate's like, look, deal with it in your own courts. And they're like, no, we cannot execute him. So the death penalty is in view from the beginning. They know why they're there. And now Pilate knows as well. They want Jesus dead. This has been the case since John chapter 5, right? All the way through the gospel, we have seen time and time and time and time again that the Jewish leadership wants to see Jesus dead. I mean, there have been literally two attempts by the people to kill Jesus before he ever makes it to Pilate. But it wasn't his hour then, but now his hour has come. And so he is standing before Pilate and his life is on the line. Given that the Jewish leadership hasn't wanted to go into Pilate's house because it might make them ceremonially unclean for the Passover festivities, now Pilate and Jesus are alone as Pilate questions Jesus. Pilate opens up with the most important question, are you the king of the Jews? This is at the heart of the Roman concern. Pilate doesn't care about internal Jewish theological debates. He doesn't really care whether or not Jesus is some prophesied Jewish figure. What he cares about is, Jesus, are you making political claims? Are you a king? The fascinating thing that happens here is that Pilate is supposed to be interrogating Jesus, and yet Jesus flips the script and begins to ask Pilate a question. Is this your own idea, calling me the king of the Jews? Or is this something that somebody else has told you? Pilate says, am I a Jew? What do I care, right? Like your chief priests, your people, they brought you to me. What have you done? Jesus responds by saying, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my people would be fighting for me right now. This is a reality that I think a lot of Christians need to continue to grab a hold of. This world is not where the kingdom fight belongs. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? This is our concern as followers of Christ should not be this temporal life. What we should be looking for is living for eternity. And so as our perspective shifts where our treasure is, that is where our heart should be as well. So if our heart and our treasure are in the kingdom of God, if they're in heaven, then we don't need to fight to hold on to every little thing that we have here. We begin to be a people who can hold things with an open hand and we can let things go. Because if Jesus could lay down his life and say, look, my kingdom is not of this world, then what are we holding on to? What are we fighting for if Jesus was willing to leave the 12 and go to the cross? We need to gain the eternal perspective of seeing the kingdom of God and allowing that perspective to shape our lives, to shape our decisions, to shape our hopes, our dreams, our fears, and our anxiety. According to Jesus, there's really only one person who should be feared, and that is the one who judges us ultimately. Jesus has the authority. Jesus is the judge. As Jesus and Pilate come together, Pilate thinks he's judging Jesus, but the truth of who Jesus is, is ultimately judging him. You are a king then, Pilate says, and so you think uh, Jesus has confessed he is a king. C.H. Dodd translates this next phrase as, king is your word, not mine. And so Jesus is acknowledging that yes, there is a claim to kingship, but it is not the kind of kingship that Pilate thinks that he is making. Jesus goes on to say that it is for this purpose that he was born and came into the world to reveal the truth and that everyone who is on the side of truth listens to him. And Pilate has a response that is so typical of today. He says, what is truth? And he leaves without waiting for an answer from Jesus. Now, Jesus has already told us the answer. 
It's not what is the truth, it's the wrong question. The question is, who is the truth? Jesus has already said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so Pilate is left questioning what is the truth when the person who is the truth was sitting right in front of him. We shouldn't miss the irony in these final verses. Pilate is offering the Jewish leaders an opportunity for Jesus to be released without being charged with a crime. Pilate is absolving Jesus of guilt in this moment. And yet, the Jewish leaders say, no, we do not want Jesus back. Instead, give us Barabbas. And Barabbas had been involved in a violent insurrection. Barabbas was the kind of person who was doing exactly what the Romans feared. And now the Jewish leaders are asking for Barabbas to be released rather than Jesus. Jesus, who in the garden has already made it clear that he is not going to lead an armed insurrection. He has told his followers that violence isn't the way. And now the Jewish people are calling for someone who has led the kind of revolt that would lead to Romans crushing them. And they want that man rather than Jesus. As we come into Holy Week, these stories of Jesus are so familiar to many of us who have been raised in the church. But I don't want us to lose sight of the little details as we work through the rest of the Gospel of John. These stories are important, but they're familiar. And as things become familiar, we can gloss over things that are vital to a deeper understanding. So as we enter Holy Week, I want to encourage you to just focus in on the life of Jesus. Look at these last few hours of Jesus' life in the Gospel of John, and let's be refreshed and renewed as we read them together. Thank you so much for watching. If you're enjoying the channel, please go ahead and subscribe. Give the video a thumbs up if you like it, and it is my sincere hope that you have an amazing and blessed day. I'll see you tomorrow.